Okay, now that we've discussed ways of proving things, let's talk about formal proofs. Okay, we saw in an earlier video that classical first order logic treats the identity symbol as a special kind of predicate. And we write this in infix notation like this so that it comes between the two terms rather than in front of them in infix notation. Now identity has a number of really interesting properties and some of these are going to inform our formal rules for constructing proofs that use identity. The first of these properties is reflexivity. And what this says is just that A equals A for any A. This is going to form the basis of our first proof which equals intro or identity introduction. So let's, in, let's put in our Fitch style bar and we'll just say A equals A is permissible at any time on the grounds of this property reflexivity using the rule equals intro. And that's our first rule governing the use of identity. Now the second property that identity has that's very interesting for our present purposes is what's sometimes called indiscernibility or indiscernibility of identicals. And what this tells us is that if A equals B, then whatever applies to A applies to B. So for instance, if A is a cube and A equals B, then B is a cube as well. This gives us our second rule for identity, which allows us to eliminate the identity symbol under the following conditions. Suppose we have a predicate that applies to a term t, and at some point t equals t prime, then we're allowed to eliminate this identity symbol and apply the predicate directly to t prime. That is, using equals elim. So these are our two rules for the identity symbol, and they're going to be what we use to construct proofs using identity. Now, there are other properties that identity has that are really quite interesting, and we don't make these rules because we can prove them on the basis of these. The first is called symmetry, and that just tells us that if A equals B, then B equals A. The second is transitivity. And that tells us that if, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And we're going to prove this constructing a Fitch style proof right here. So first we'll introduce our Fitch bar and we'll write down our premises A equals B and B equals C and our goal down here is to get A equals C. Well first let's use our first rule A intro which will form the basis of the elim rule that we'll need to get the b out of the picture and have a equals c. So a equals a, that's equals intro. I'm going to number these just to make this easier. The next then is b equals a, which we get by 1 and 3 equals elim. Let's use our reiteration rule, which just says that any time there's a line above whatever line we're on, we are able to cite it further down, provided it doesn't appear in a subproof, which is something that we'll discuss later. So this is a reiteration of line two. We don't need this, but sometimes it's nice to have a premise right in front of you, especially in longer proofs, and the R rule allows us to do just that. Now we can apply our elim rule to 4 and 5 and get A equals C. 4, 5 equals elim. And that is just what we were going for. You see? 
since it's our goal sentence right here. So on the basis of what we've observed about symmetry and indiscernibility of identicals, we can construct proofs of further properties that equals has like transitivity. Now perhaps you're asking yourself, why do we have to go through all this trouble? Why not just make a transitivity rule? And the truth is we could. Um, it would perhaps make the logic easier to use when we're constructing Fitch style proofs. But the thing is that we would get ease of use by complicating our system quite a bit. Um, we could also have rules, for instance, to govern between. So, for example, imagine the following rule between A, B, C. So A is between B and C, gets us between. A, C, B. Anything that's between two things will be between them in any order. So this will actually work as a rule. But we're further complicating our system and we don't need to because we can prove this on the basis of the rules that exist. There's also good reason to want simpler systems. First off, it just means you have fewer rules to learn. And second, it makes proofs about those systems, what we call metalogical proofs, much easier. For the most part, we won't have many metalogical concerns in this course, but it explains anyway why we want to keep things as simple as we can. I discussed this in an earlier optional video about the first order language of arithmetic, and so if you're curious about this, you can check that video out.